the law chapter. Yes. 30A, 6 and 20. And the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the school committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. Um, let's see. The meeting access code is 1796076907, and the meeting password is Tuesday. The first thing I would like to do is ask for a moment of silence to honor all of those who are serving our country in grave danger and doing their jobs to protect all of us. Thank you. We wish everyone a safe ride through the next few weeks and beyond. The next item is approval of minutes of August 10th, 2020. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of August 2nd, 2020. All those in favor, Ms. Simon? Aye. Mrs. Bond? Aye. Mr. Foss? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Chairman votes aye. I don't know where Tom is. So, um, Sharon, I guess that's 4-0-0. So I didn't hear Tom vote. The next item is approval of the minutes of December 15th, 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. We moved and seconded to approve the minutes of December 15th, 2020. All those in favor, Mr. Foss? Mr. Foss? Aye. Ms. Simon? Aye. Mrs. Bond? Aye. Tom, you back with us? Tom, you voting on the minutes? Okay, chairman votes aye, and that is again, four zero zero. The next item is public participation. <coughs> Reveille, what I, was I vote aye, having some connection problems. Okay, on both minutes? <laughs> aye. Aye, okay. You got that, Sharon? Sharon's not going to tell me. It's a secret. Um, public participation for anything that is not on the agenda is <laughs> somebody tap dancing. <laughs> um, so if there's anyone in the participant list that wants to speak on anything that is not on the agenda, please put your hand up by hovering over your name with your cursor and clicking on the hand. Uh, Mrs. Chair, there, there is one person looking to um, comment, has her hand raised. Okay, I see that. Grace, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Genusis. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Monaco. Um, yeah. I just want to um, mention two things real quickly. Uh, the first is I know Burlington does a lot of data collection, um, like with iReady and the, the math assessments. Um, 
my son came home this week and mentioned they did their eye ready and that he didn't move his score at all. And then he added that nobody in his class moved their score, um, that they all stayed the same or went lower. Um, so I think I, it just came to my mind that we collect such rich data and I would be interested to know kind of an overall picture over the last few years compared to this year, wh how are the kids doing? I mean, they've been impacted, um, but it would be helpful to know to, to what degree um, the kids are doing and making progress um, district wide. Um, I, I think that would be helpful for us to know, you know, are all the kids trending this way where they're just kind of maintaining skills or are they making the progress that we'd like them to? Um, so that was one thing that I think would be interesting because I know all those mid cycle things are happening now. The other thing I wanted to comment on was that I know last meeting there was um, a, the superintendents are writing some sort of letter to legislation about um, waiving MCAS. Um, I just want to, my concern was, yes, we all want kids to graduate. My concern is there was no talk about how are we going to teach the kids the skills that they don't have. They're not passing the MCAS because they don't have some of these skills. How are we going to make sure these kids are graduating with those skills because otherwise it's a disservice if we're not providing them the instruction that they're not getting. So I would just advocate that that's included in that piece. How are we going to teach the kids the skills that they need? Thank you for, for your time. Okay, Dr. Conti, do you want to address that? Um, uh, Mrs. Monaco, we have MCAS later on in the agenda. I, I think um, we were just, mostly talking about the the state testing for the the immediate future and i think that had to do with the school committee resolution so um we can certainly do that um and um i think we will look at our um our prog our um our screening data for um literacy and math we're actually using more of the screening tools in middle school so i would agree with uh, mr Janusis. we'll we'll look at um uh, some year to year, I think tools like iReady, it's it's um, they don't have the um, the same standard throughout the year, so they have a, a fall standard and a mid year standard and a year end standard. So if if scores are remaining um, level, um, the the standards aren't the same. So th there would be some growth. We want to see scores increasing. So I'm not saying we're satisfied, but um, but uh, iReady in particular, I know um, has. Uh, changes the changes the standards over the course of the year so again they would have um third grade mid-year the third grade mid-year assessment is different than the fall assessment and different than the year-end assessment um but we will certainly look at that i think year to year we do every year and um i think those are important tools and they are connected to the to our um uh, to some of our comments about the state test is that we we don't need the state test as a diagnostic, first of all, because it's not designed as a diagnostic, but second of all, because we have better diagnostics within, within the district. So again, it's a much longer conversation, Mrs. Monaco, but we will we will look at our student data if the school committee wants us to put something together with that data, looking at this year in particular, we, we can we can do that. Um, I, I think that there are two things. One is we all know that given the pandemic that um, our kids are not getting what we'd like them to get. So I think there are two questions. One is, are they making typical progress or not? And the other is, if we're graduating students without MCAS, do they have the skills? Could they pass the MCAS? You know, that, that's kind of a question. You don't, you don't want to hold them back but because of a pandemic, but on the other hand, you uh, don't want them to move on without the adequate skills. So maybe uh, you could let us know more at the next meeting. Um, again, we could, there, there are some timing issues here and I'm glad Mark and Joe are here. So most of our high school um, students take, uh, finish with their MCAS requirements their sophomore year. So um, the state is primarily worried about uh, juniors and seniors who haven't passed uh, the MCAS yet. So Joe, I see you on the screen. Mark, I'm assuming you're there. Um, and so um, I'm assuming, again, or you should answer the question, uh, do we have seniors who we're concerned or haven't passed the MCAS yet in regards to their diploma? We were still responsible to make sure um, we do have one senior that still needs to take uh, a math test. 
In addition to that, we have about four other seniors that are new to the state of Massachusetts. So those students are also required to take an MCAS. And so, as um, as you know, Eric Desi did just say, students can be waived from passing the test. They still need to take a course that covers the necessary material. For lack of a better term, an MCAS approved course. So those seniors not taking the test will be taking um, a course that has been reviewed and is considered an MCAS approved course, which is a standard English class. And that would be the evidence they need for English and the same thing for math and science as well. So there's one student that, although he didn't pass the MCAS test uh, when he took the retest last year, we're still having that student take um, an appropriate course in order to qualify for the waiver. So waiver isn't just, it's, you know, kind of a free for all. There, there are some expectations around what the students would be expected to do. So again, Mrs. Monaco, to answer your question, I, I think um, our seniors are graduating um, except, you know, for a handful, which will take a different course with the skills that MCAS um, would, would identify for them. And then um, again, we're, we're hoping to get sort of um, um, back on a more typical routine um, starting next fall. Okay, then maybe at the next meeting, you could let us know what you find out relative to the I ready or whatever other tests, you know, just to, I don't mean details. I mean, uh, you know, are the kids making progress in this situation or not? I think we'd like to know that. That's the stuff I really like. So I, I could do that for a couple hours next meeting. Oh, great. Okay. Um, moving on, I don't see any other hands. Um, information and reports, student representative, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a long list today, so I'm gonna keep going and going. So feel free to just stop me at any point if you like to say something. Um, so I'm gonna just start as I always do with like student council and things that are happening in the student body, and then I'll move into the equity reports that I give. So first and foremost, um, the class of 2021 student council is organizing a throwback day that we will usually have during like spirit week. Um, and that's going to be, that was today for cohort A and it's going to be the 15th for cohort B. So it's something like fun. I'm not sure how many people are being part of like the whole like dressing up as throwback, um, but it's something fun that the class is trying to organize. Um, the next thing that the class of 2021 student council is organizing is a blaze pizza fundraiser. Um, it's this Friday from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. And like order um, in between that time and 20% of whatever they make will go to the student council. So those are like two events that are happening from the student council. Um, next, uh, the National Honor Society, um, they just um, received like their new t-shirts that have been designed. Um, and they were designed by me, so I'll get to see them in person on Thursday when I will go to pick them up and we're going to like take pictures with them on like virtually to try to see if we can put that in the yearbook. Um, and the NHS is also um, organizing this like collaboration um, with a blood drive that's on Thursday from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. The blood drive, um, it's, a, it's a community blood drive. And if we like participate in it, then we'll get like community service hours that are required for NHS. Um, and also we can use it for adopt a class. So um, that's something interesting. The next thing is the multi-humans of VHS club. They had their like virtual culture fest, um, I think starting from December 21st up until the new year. And they did um, extend the Culture Fest to last till January 25th because there were a low number of submissions across 
all schools, um, even though it was open for elementary, middle, and high school. Um, I think that's a concern that like a lot of clubs are having at the high school this year is that they're having trouble like pulling off events um, that are especially like virtual. Um, but I guess like every club is trying their best to um, to do and like make it fun at least in the, in the slightest way for the students. So um, the culture fest is being extended and we still have those prizes. Um, it's like the schoolhouse gift card and a true north gift card. So we're encouraging more um, students to participate. Um, the same club is also planning uh, this songs like playlist for lunch. Um, and we did have a playlist like before, but with this playlist, the goal is to include songs from different countries, um, different music industries globally. Uh, and these songs will again be played during lunch on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, so they're making the playlist this week and hopefully by next week we'll have those new songs um, to be played like during, during lunch next week. Um, the next thing that happened was that last week Poetry Out Loud semifinals happened across the entire high school. Um, and the final competition is going to be on the 19th. So um, I'm just going to read off, uh, read off the names of the finalists that are participating. So um, there are Christian, Annie, Theo Devar, Elizabeth Forbush, Sean Gallagher, Maddie Goltz, Tanya Hossein, Marin James, and Diana Watson. So all these finalists will be competing for the finals of BHS. Uh, and that will take place on the 19th. Um, and yeah, so that's the Poetry Out Loud. Um, and then I guess the next thing is the Equity Committee report. So um, as I've said this, like, Sarah? Um, yeah. Before you move on to the equity, uh, could I just ask a question? Um, uh, for the throwback day, how far are you throwing back? <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Um, just, I wanted to offer Mr. Murphy might be able to, um, might be able to, I'm not sure you're going that far back, but if, if, um, if you really want to go back in VHS history, I'm sure Mr. Murphy would make himself available. <laughs> For sure. Um, I think I think the goal is the 80s. <laughs> all, all the way to the 80s? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I think we are expecting people to show up in like neon, like socks and neon shirts and like silly ponytails. I don't know. Um, what I'm else? Making me feel old. <laughs> but, uh, I, think, I think Mr. Murphy can help. <laughs> From the 80s? Yeah. I I also want to ask about a couple of the other items, if I could. It, it, sure. does, it does sound like fun, but if I may, um, mm -hmm. for the blood drive, it's at the high school, and is it? It's open to the community. So it's not at the high school. It's actually um, part of. Um, I think it's called American Legion. I think it's like a place on Wind Street that you so, just have to go. And it's Thursday, we mm -hmm. with Thursday this week, like yeah, yeah, the fourteenth. What are the hours for that? Two p.m. to seven p.m. I'm sorry. Three. Two p.m. to seven p.m. Because they do other blood drives there on Tuesdays, so this is like an extra one that you're sponsoring. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just called the Burlington Community Blood Drive by American Legion Burlington on 162 Wind Street, so. Is there some way we can, I don't know, tweet that out so that people in the community would know about it? Give it more uh, opportunity for more people to participate would be good, okay? Yeah, I can, I can probably do that from like the student council and like NHS, I guess. And maybe Mr. Larkin could put it on the BPS one or something? Yes, we can, we can do that. Great. Um, I also uh, love your idea, the idea of the club putting together the global playlist, music playlist for lunch. So that's really very great. Um, and then, 
Uh, and then for Culture Fest, I just wanted to highlight that some more because in the past, of course, Culture Fest has been really wonderful in person. And I think what the idea that you've come up with is really clever, uh, where uh, if, if you can maybe explain it and, and then I, I, maybe offline, you and I could talk. I, I'm trying to think of other ways. I don't know how many people are watching tonight will be relevant for. So maybe not going into a lot of detail tonight, but how else can we get out to more of the teachers to encourage their students or to more of the students or to more of the families? And I know in the past, you know, if you could maybe reach out to some of the groups that did um, last year, maybe they'd be willing to do something. And especially where I, uh, the, the, the ones that have, have been done, which are really lovely, were very brief. Some of them were just a photograph. Um, so it doesn't have to be a whole performance or a whole uh, talk, which we've done when it's in person. But um, we have to talk. Can we talk after um, or tomorrow sometime about ways to get the word out? Because it, it is a great way to do it virtually. So I want to thank you for making sure that making that happen. All the students who are doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can chat later sometime um, okay. about that. Um, it, it's really sad because like as seniors, like this was supposed to be our like last culture fest and the fact that it didn't happen, um, it is really sad, but I guess um, we're still looking like, we are feeling more hopeful for like the future. Um, and we're just at least hoping that this virtual culture fest could be a success. So that's why we're extending it to try to see if more people are still interested, so. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay, Sarah, go ahead with your presentation. Okay, um, so the Burlington Public Library um, has new social justice series events. So there's one this Thursday again, um, and it's on mass, mass incarceration. I think it's at seven o'clock. Um, so I think it would be really helpful if people like signed up for that. There were a lot of people who joined last one, which was on immigration, um, which is really nice to see that a lot of people did participate. So um, it would be great if more people could participate. Um, even now it's open to anyone um, in Burlington. So um, that would be great. The next thing is that, I don't know if I mentioned in the last meeting, but, um, through the Burlington Public Libraries and Social Justice events, there was this um, service club that's that was formed among students of other towns nearby. So there are students from Wilmington, um, Tewksbury, our Burlington, and we meet like once a month um, and we discuss like what are some things that we can do as the towns like combine together and what like effort we can need to fight like social justice. So we're meeting um, this Saturday. So this is something that like any student can join. So I just wanted to like say it right now. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, when it comes to the equity committee, um, we're meeting on the 21st. So I don't have anything specifically to to report out from the committee, but um, as part of the hiring process working group that I'm part of, um, we did meet on Monday, um, so yesterday, and we were talking about um, the interview questions that we wanted to send out that could potentially be used for the interview process of the director of DI that's going to start soon. Um, and these interview questions will basically test the cultural like competency um, of these like um, people who are looking forward to get the job as a teacher or any other position. Um, and we're trying to see how we can expand like um, the role of like teachers as well as like the profession in specifically for minorities at our high school. Um, so we're trying to discuss more ways to do that and we might also as a group um, create some sort of guide for, like interviews when it comes to like testing um, like equity or cultural competency um, and I guess on behalf of like the interview committee um, for the director of DI 
the posting is being closed on the 29th of this month. So after that posting is closed, we are going to start meeting first to discuss who we want to invite for our first round of interviews. Um, and I think I said this before, but I'm part of the committee, the inter interview process committee, which I'm really glad about. And I'm really looking forward to it, but we have like more than 30 applicants. So um, it's gonna take a while, but we're going to get through with that. And we're probably gonna have our first round of interviews around February. So um, that's how the timeline is looking for in that. Um, there's also a new um, Burlington Against Racism youth group that was started um, last month. Yeah, um, we, we are meeting as like a community, like student group that's outside of just the high school. So, um, so we, we're basically like under like Burlington Against Racism as a whole. Um, we're looking for ways that us students can impact like different um, areas in Burlington specifically. So for now, we're discussing different resources that we can put up on the website regarding financial literacy for different groups um, in Burlington. We're also looking for um, more information regarding like immigration and how um, immigrants in our town specifically have been impacted by either COVID or just like in general when it comes to like economic standing or anything like that. Um, so that's another great group for students to be part of. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about um, were these surveys that I put out on our student council like Instagram page. So I did wanted to get more like, I guess, information and like some slight stats uh, regarding like preference for hybrid or all remote or uh, um, like things like that. So um, like on our Instagram stories, I put up like these polls um, and one of them was like which learning do you prefer, um, hybrid or, or remote? And 31 people voted for hybrid and 22 people voted for all remote. Um, when it comes to the new policy that was started at the beginning of the year of keeping our cameras on um, in the entire class, which was basically aimed to increase like student like um, participation as well as like making sure that we pay attention during the class. Um, I asked the question that do you think our new policy uh, is helping you during class when it comes to like learning uh, 19 people voted yes and 42 people voted no. Um, I think that's in one thing that a lot of students are like having mixed feelings about because for some reason like keeping our cameras on is still not making us feel like that engaged or willing to participate. Um, so that's also another thing that I wanted to get out. Um, the other thing, uh, somebody, um, a senior said that their workload that they were receiving as students felt feels more that more than we, they're used to in the past, which I think a lot of um, teachers and students are having like concerns about, um, but um, I know that like a lot of teachers are like trying their best to give us less work or like keep everything managed. So I know that like it's not like a feeling that's completely like present across every single person in the student body. Um, so yeah, and and then for hybrid students, I asked people, do you feel safe coming to school while COVID-19 cases are rising in our state? And 26 people voted yes, and 21 people voted no. Um, I think that was another thing that a lot of students were doing was that now we don't see a lot of students coming in person, especially for us seniors. Um, like the other day, our class had no no student like coming in person. Everybody was at home. Um, and it might be due to like the COVID cases like rising and people just choosing to not go to school. Um, but I wanted to mention that. And then the 
I did was um, this like slide bar that shows like how likely are you to like want to switch to like all remote and the average answer was more leaning towards the left, meaning like they did not want to switch. So I think people are kind of like okay with what they have, like whether it's hybrid or all remote. Um, and I know that Ms. Um, Ms. Bond like asked me earlier, like last meeting about like feedback from remote students. So I did ask more people this time and one major like concern that they were presenting was how at the high school, um, a lot of people had to enroll in VHS courses. So VHS meaning virtual high school courses. Um, and that was completely like, I guess, different um, in the way that like Burlington school students like normally learned at VHS. So um, like people are saying that they had, they were having like miserable time learning through like these third party like vendors for courses um, when they were planning about like um, going like all remote in the beginning of the year, they were assured that like they won't have their, they won't have to go to other third party like sites. Um, but in order to like choose their like science classes or like math classes that are required for graduating, if they were not available at the school, they had to take VHS courses. And they said that like it was completely like asynchronous and it was like a pain to like keep up with all the work that VHS courses offered. So um, I think that's a lot of like, that's one of the biggest issues that the students who are all remote are facing. Um, and like, that's that's another thing that like, um, the, the school could not guarantee core classes like, um, like English or math. So they had to like take courses through VHS and they were not like equivalent to what um, our school teaches because they don't have live instruction and they don't even have um, like pre-recorded lectures even. So a lot of it was just self-learning and that is very difficult for people, especially during this time. Um, so, so that was like the feedback that I got from students who are all remote. And I think, yeah, and I think that's all. Okay. I, mean, I kind of spoke for like a long time, but, uh, but we are meeting after a long time. So I guess um, it's okay. <laughs> Made up for lost time. <laughs> Okay, and before we move on, does anyone have anything they need to um, ask about any of that? Okay, um, moving on. Thank you, Sarah. Nice job. Lengthy, but great. Um, subcommittee reports. Anyone have any subcommittee reports? Uh, Mr. Murphy, maybe uh, have you got anything on the cleanup? From Has Rec been involved in the cleanup around the high school? <coughs> Um, according to Kevin's email uh, and Brendan's email, they've been looking into it. We're meeting tomorrow at, uh, at one o'clock, so I'll get an update then. Okay, thanks. Um, Tell us what cleanup you're talking about. Oh, I got a complaint from um, someone who walks the area, a gentleman who walks around there and he uh, called me to tell me that he'd seen a lot of uh, empty bottles and masks that had been discarded uh, and, and just junk in general uh, around the um, the wetlands and around the fence and the track and above on Cambridge Street and so I asked um, both the school department and the rec department to see if they could take care of it. And Mrs. Chair, um, if I could, I can confirm that um, the rec department did um, attend that and um, clean up some of that and our uh, school department employees did as well. Great. So great. Thank you very much. Are there, any, are there subcommittee reports from anyone uh, else? No. Madam, Madam Chair, the um, the budget update was meant to be a subcommittee report because um, 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 the school committee subcommittee for the uh, selectmen met 
um, with uh, with Ways and Means uh, regarding um, uh, fiscal 22. And um, I think we're a little bit um, in a different place with our uh, budget calendar than we normally are. Typically, our budget calendar has is is established by now. I think the town is is waiting to um, see uh, what revenues are available, and I think there were there's some talk, obviously, of a federal relief package, and if those revenues can be um, util, utilized by um, cities and towns for revenue um, shortfall. So again, I don't want to take um, Mr. Murphy or or your or your thunder, but um, I do think that was an important meeting, um, and um, just for the committee as a whole um, um, and um, Mr. Foss and Ms. Bond, this might be your, your sort of first time through the process, but we're we're later than we typically uh, than we typically are uh, with the budget process um, because uh, people are waiting for better for better data. And I think um, there, there there may be some changes coming up uh, in in a few weeks. Um, I, I do think a clear message from the town's financial team is that uh, local revenues are are um, significantly impacted by the uh, by the pandemic in, in, in Burlington, and uh, fiscal 22 is going to be a uh, a challenging year to maintain services. So I think that was the the message that we got, and um, we're still sort of um, working through what that means. Um, but uh, typically, the school committee would have a budget calendar um, by this time, and um, we're we're sort of probably going to get that to you in the next couple of weeks. But we're we're about a month behind where we typically would be. Eric, don't we have a meeting tomorrow night with that on the guidelines? We do. Um, okay. So so again, we're going to continue to make work. I just wanted to make the point, Mrs. Monaco, that we're. Um, um, behind where we normally are uh, at okay. this time in terms of the, the budget and, and budget process. All right, Tom, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's pretty accurate. And uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll get a little better idea of how things are trending. And, and uh, I think it's safe to say that it's going to be a difficult year. It's just a question about how difficult. Yeah. Martha? I just uh, happened to read recently that a neighboring town was given a guideline of 4% for their schools. Well, which town? So I wanted to throw that out because, you know, I know it's going to be tight and I know that's not going to be a number that the town is going to offer us, but there are towns nearby. Winchester is what I read about. Um, wow. They don't have as much, you know, uh, commercial base as we do. So maybe they're not as dependent on the commercial base. Yeah. But but there are towns that are saying the schools need to continue to have their um, businesses. So just wanted to add. That. Okay. Anything else on subcommittee before I give um, a chairman's report, which is unusual, but I'm about to give it. Okay. So I I don't usually put a chairman's report on the agenda, but there's something that I wanted to bring up at this meeting. And Sharon, I would ask you to please take really careful notes on this one in case um, we need them in the future for any reason. So we got a letter from the Inspector General a month or so ago, and through our attorney, we responded to that letter. Um, it either is or will be when they get around to it on their website with either our full response or a partial, maybe a summary of our response, I'm not sure which. Um, at that point in time, the two documents will be um, public. And uh, basically everything that we know is in those documents. So I'm not looking for a conversation or a discussion. I just wanna be sure and mention it in public. Um, when when the IG looks into something, they don't tell you much. In fact, they tell anyone they speak to not to talk about it. So um, I can only give you what I think happened because I don't really know. So I believe it all started about three years ago with a complaint 
um, from some one or more individuals who noticed Dr. Conti working on his car in the maintenance bay um, and borrowing a school trailer, both of which he had school committee permission to do. Um, in fact, we encouraged him uh, by putting a, um, a clause in his contract that um, gave him permission to use things of that nature when they weren't being used by the department. So, um, it turns out that when he became aware that there was a question about it, he stopped using it and asked us to talk, to take that clause out of his contract, which we eventually did. So the um, inspector general kind of kind of gave us a verbal, you know, you shouldn't have clauses like that in, in contracts, which is okay. It's too bad because it's a benefit that doesn't cost anybody anything. Um, and while they were looking at all of the um, things in the, uh, this, this all happened like three years ago and they're A, very slow and B, COVID probably slowed them down even more. But when they were looking into all this, they also picked up on a reimbursement mechanism that they didn't like, but they didn't realize that when Nicole came in, um, she had changed it. It was a reimbursement for staff members that had purchased things and they wanted us to do it differently. So all in all, they, they wrote us a letter saying, hey, you can't do these two things. And we wrote them back saying, uh, no problem, we've taken care of them. And that's essentially where the two letters ended and that's the end of it. But um, I just wanted to make sure that nobody said we were, you know, hiding a letter from the AG. You can find it when they post it if they haven't already on their website. IG, not AG, IG. Um, and like I said, we don't discuss either personnel issues or contract negotiations in public. So unless there's some reason for anyone to comment, I'm just gonna leave it there and move on. Kristen? Um, since I'm not on the board anymore, I just want to state that I was the chair during the time of this. This was three years ago. Um, so I had that contact um, and as you said, everything was taken seriously, all recommendations, all reviews, all questions. It was in the same time frame of Power and Sullivan. So everything was taken very seriously. And at the end of my term, I didn't want to leave this undone, knowing that eventually there might be a report out. But I knew that the district was being left in a much stronger fiscally and procedural place than it was when we started. So I have full confidence moving forward. And when that letter does get posted, hoping the town will recognize it. So that's just why I'm here tonight to say I'm still here. And we took everything to the highest um, level that we could. So thank you. Yeah, we took it all seriously because when somebody files any kind of a complaint of any sort, you want to deal with it and make sure you do the right thing, which is exactly um, what we did. Um, but at no time did Dr. Conti do anything he wasn't supposed to do. He was he had permission for everything he did. Okay, moving on. Uh, ways and means. Is there a ways and means? Um, Roger, are you present? Um, um, I'm on the phone tonight. I'm having internet difficulties otherwise. At this point, I don't think I have anything to, to uh, add to. I too am interested in the FY22 budget process, but ways and means hasn't uh, convened on the subject yet. So okay. That's it for me. That's it for you, huh? All right, um, I, I understand Sarah has something else. Sorry about that. Um, 
I thought I was done, but I was not done. Um, there was one thing that I forgot to mention. So, um, with one of the one of the surveys that I did, another question that I asked was, um, "Do you think our teachers took a pro appropriate time out of class to discuss the events that happened at the Capitol last week?" Um, and forty one of the students said yes, and fourteen students said no, and um, I guess. I just wanted to talk about what happened um, because it did take up most of our time like on Thursday and Friday to talk about this. I know this just at the high school level and most like mostly in my classes, but almost all of my teachers took like the majority of the time to talk with students about what happened. And I think that was very important for teachers to do and um, when it comes to like talking about this, um, I feel like once you, when you have conversations, uh, you learn more. Um, and uh, especially like in our English class, uh, we talked about um, like different like vocabulary to use like protests, um, like what do we call people who do protests and who do other things and how all of it could be like mangled up in the media um, we talked about like different forms of like literature or songs or um, like TV shows that talk about protest and how like that could be compared to what happened in the Capitol. And I think I'm speaking this um, from like all of the students, but like truly we all just felt frustrated at what happened and we also felt like embarrassed that it happened. Um, I think a lot of students um, were feeling that like um, that like there was no like, you know, point with what happened. And it was just plain right, like disrespectful at whoever that worked in law and who were working there at the moment. Um, and I know that like Mr. Sullivan gave like an announcement uh, during our classes on Thursday um like giving a statement about what happened and that was really helpful so thank you mr sullivan um and i just think like it was just important for all of us to talk about it and i forgot to say this in the in the report so i just wanted to mention it right now all right thank you um we're going to move on the coronavirus update from the superintendent uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Sarah, I'm sure there are lots of adults who share your um, some uh, some similar feelings as well. So I, I think um, the teachers took um, I think took the event seriously. Obviously, there are age appropriate ways to um, to discuss that, and and we really tried to share some tools um, for for teachers to help with those discussions. So again, I think that was handled very well by our principals and 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 by our teachers and. Obviously, I think it's an ongoing um, ongoing situation that we're all going to have to um, discuss. But uh, so, um, Madam Chair, the um, um, I just did a, a uh, update. I think I shared with the committee on um, on BCAT. I don't want to repeat uh, a lot of what I what I've uh, said. I think the um, um, the group that I'm really spending um, time listening to in terms of public health, obviously, is the, the Burlington Board of Health, which is which has been a partner from the beginning. But the uh, Ariadne group, which is from the Chan School of Public Health, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and talking to their public health experts and researchers. Um, and I think the um, challenge with staying, keeping our classrooms open for in-person versus um, remote um, is that um, uh, districts are making this decision um, district by district. So um, so we have neighboring districts that may be remote while we're in person. And um, it just, I think it adds uh, confusion to, to an already confusing situation. So um, I think we're trying to make the best decisions uh, that we can. Um, some of the challenges that we're facing now are um, not necessarily with student positivity, but um, as we have um, more adults who are being impacted, we have to make sure we have enough staff to run um, 
of run our schools. So um, this week is the first week we've bumped into having classes to go um, fully remote, um, not because there was a positive student in the class, but because uh, we didn't have an adult to, um, to teach the class. So um, I, I think um, we, we may end up seeing more of that. And um, it's just a, it's a, it's, again, the situation is very dynamic. Um, we are, again, trying to prioritize um, um, keeping our schools uh, open in person uh, for as long, as long as we can. And um, I think the precautions that we've put in place and the protocols that we've put in place have allowed us to stay open uh, to this point. So we're really trying to uh, stick to those moving forward. There's no doubt that um, the positivity in the community is, has increased. Um, certainly from the, the summer, that positivity in the Commonwealth is increasing. And so um, at some point, we may need to make um, some targeted closures um, because of the availability of, of staff and, and, and of, um, uh, to teach or because of other, um, other impacts that we have. So um, the state, unlike March, the state, I believe, is um, not going to um, make a state decision to close schools. So this is going to continue to be a, a local decision uh, moving forward. And again, um, we are getting public health advice. I'm not claiming to be a public health expert, but we are trying to talk to people and, and um, follow our protocols. So again, Madam Chair, all of that was on my BCAT report. Again, I don't want to be too repetitive, but I, I do think having some districts remote and some districts um, in person um, can cause some confusion and anxiety. And, and um, we, we are doing trying to do the best we can for um, Burlington students, given um, uh, what we're seeing uh, here in Burlington. Um, so with your permission in terms of um, moving on, I just one last thing, just because the state um, is um, pushing out a pool testing program. And um, I think we've talked about this before, just to clarify, um, Individual testing is when one person sample ends up in one test tube and they sample that test tube for whether the person is positive or has um, uh, indications or, or is uh, testing for the virus. Um, so you can basically take that test and attribute it to one person. Pool testing is when you put a group of 10 people into one test. And then if the, if the sample is positive, then you know one of those 10 people is positive, and then you have to follow up that sample with individual testing if you want to identify um, who the individual is. So the state is trying to move forward with um, pool testing, uh, making that available. Um, I believe they said they're paying for six weeks and then expecting districts to pick up the cost after six weeks. Um, the state's only providing the test. They're not providing any of the resources or the personnel or the time to um, administer the, the pool testing. So we have to do that. Um, again, my colleagues are mixed on the, uh, on the proposal. Um, I'm not a, a huge proponent of pool testing at this time. I think if it were September, I might be more interested. I think pool testing um, is not about the pool test. It's about the tests that follow. Um, because you have to identify who the individuals um, are. I don't necessarily think it helps keep kids in school. Um, and it doesn't help um, with our uh, adult testing, which might be more of a priority. And honestly, I'd rather the state um, put their effort into uh, getting the vaccine out as quickly as possible um, instead of um, putting their resources towards um, towards pool testing. So I'm not sure if the committee has any strong feelings about pool testing or if you've heard about it from others. Uh, we're certainly involved in those in those conversations. Um, but um, I, I'm, I, again, I have really have mixed feelings. We're supposed to notify the state by Friday if we want to be part of the of the six week state pilot. And again, like many things, um, the districts around us are pretty much split. I think half are going to try the pilot, half are going to um, not participate. So um, I'm in the not participate um, camp right now, um, but I'm still looking at it and and thinking about it carefully. 
All right. Um, yeah, Catherine, you had your hand up. Well, he, uh, I was going to ask that question and he read my mind. So <laughs> I was going to ask, you know, what your opinion was or uh, in, in terms of you know, where you were, what your feelings were and talking to, uh, again, the neighboring districts. And, uh, you know, have you had conversation with any of the um, neighboring towns where they have been doing the pool testing and, um, you know, paying for it out of their own pockets? I mean, what, have you gotten any feedback from any of them? Um most of the districts who are doing testing who are paying for it use their federal dollars for testing of adults not for testing of students you wouldn't want to pool test teachers because if you do a sample of 10 teachers and you get a positive you'd have to you'd lose you'd quarantine uh 10 teachers or you'd have to wait for an individual test so um there are districts around us that are um doing individual testing um and communities that are doing individual testing um, I think Woburn is doing individual testing um, um, every, every week, um, but that's for the adults. Um, again, the pool testing, I think in speaking to people, um, when I ask them why they're doing it, they're saying it may provide some uh, some peace of mind, and they also feel like it may um, help convey the seriousness to students to change their behavior and to make sure that they are more compliant with protocols. And um, our kids have been really good, so I'm not sure um, we would get any improvement from um, pool testing, and I'm sure we would get into then, could they refuse to pool test? I mean, we, we, there'd be a whole lot of um, other issues that we have with it. Um, if someone could convince me that it it kept kids in school or it, it was, um, uh, again, worthwhile, I, I would, again, it's not it's not the work or, or jumping at it. It's it's just, um, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, what the benefits are um, and how they would benefit us right right now, and then we would have to pick up the cost in in six weeks, which seems like a long time, but it, it's it's really not. Carl, you had a question. Thank you. Um, I think that Dr. Conti, you answered it with the subtext. the 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 testing that the state is offering is for students. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, as far as I could tell, Watertown, have they been doing pool testing or individual testing? Are you, do you know that? I do. Um, we sent a team of nurses to Watertown. So they, they, were, doing, um, oh, they right. were doing individual testing um, at least several weeks ago. And I think they were exploring doing some pool testing for students just because it's a lot less expensive. So um, the individual tests were running between $50 and $60 a piece. And then I think the pool testing was running about fifteen dollars um, for um, for a um, for a group. So I think, um, but Watertown I think was doing individual testing when we sent our team out there um, for for the adults. I think they were running um, about two hundred tests a week, um, and uh, so fifty dollars a test. So again there there was about ten thousand dollars a week, I think is what they were spending on testing. Wow. And um Lexington is starting testing this week, is that correct? Uh Lexington is. We we went to the same presentation as um as Lexington in regards to um um the the testing. I'm not sure if they're moving forward with the company that we we went to them with and um and and I think they were going to uh, move forward with um, uh, with some with some testing. And and again, the questions that I needed to have answered, and I can't speak for any other community, is um, no one from the presentations that we had was able to uh, tell me what the saturation of testing would need to be in order to have a, um, a, a sort of a public health impact. So does that mean we need 100 tests a week, 200 tests a week, 300 tests a week? What's what's the number given our population? And then um, do who who has to test and can we require them to be tested? So I think what some districts are bumping into, Mr. Foss, is even if they're providing testing, um, getting people to take the test is um, it has. Not everyone is lining up to take the test either. So a lot of districts are paying for tests that they're that aren't being administered um, either. So um, 
So um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but a lot of districts are doing no, some testing. No, it's... I, I'm just I'm just not sure there's a systematic way for us to 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 do that. And I would really need an epidemiologist to tell us in Burlington, you know, in order to have a a, a sort of a a scientific impact, you, you know, you need 400 tests a week and or something like that. And and I'm not sure um, what that number is. I I appreciate your thoughts and and opinion and. I, I think that at least for pers for my perspective, um, you know, we should continue to watch what's happening in in other towns that are doing testing, and um, you know, it's just frustrating that uh, a device like a test that can can actually tell us what the spread within our school, you know, at the state and federal level, they to la for lack of a better term, they tell us to go hang, and it's. You know, they, these, this is a tool that used correctly, I think, could could be really informative as to what, if if there is any and at what level the spread within our school is. And um, it's, it's something I think that we should keep our eye on. And thanks again for your thoughts. Okay, anyone else have comments on that? Martha. Um, yeah, I, I do. Feel like uh, Dr. Conti, that your explanation of how you've come to this decision that it doesn't make sense right now uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I also have the same kinds of questions. I've been reading the papers about pool testing, and it's not clear at all how often it needs to be done and how many people out of your your group need to do it in order for it to be useful. So I, I do think it makes sense. And given that the state I mean, six weeks really isn't very much when you look at the rest of the school year. Um, and I mean, could we do it for six weeks and then not do it? Or if you do it for six weeks with a pilot, do you have to then continue doing it and paying for it? Um, I think you could probably do it and then not do it. But then I think that actually lends itself to my argument. If, if it's that valuable, um, why just do it for six weeks? So uh, again, I think there are some positive optics with this. I can say we're testing, and I think that's a good thing to say. I'm just not sure there's um, what the value is or what the saturation we would need to have to in, in order to make it um, valuable. Again, I'm all for it. If someone could say um, there's a there's an accurate saliva test that's um, inexpensive, and I believe they exist. If someone would make those available and then have us have us do that. But testing, like whether we're open for uh, in-person or remote, these decisions are being made district by district. So the comparisons are, you know, are are, are there, um, you know, and and we are all talking. So all the superintendents are talking um, very frequently, and so um, and people are trying to solve the problems that are in their, you know, un un under their authority. So um, some of those decisions are going to differ. So uh, I'm sure that um, um, Lexington and, and Julie Hackett there is doing an incredible job. I'm sure her reasoning is well thought out. Um, we just might have reached a different conclusion. So that's, um, that's you know, and, and again, she's, we, we're talking all the time. Well, and I appreciate that. And I do know that you're talking to all the other towns. So I think that you, you know, it's come to this decision based on a lot more information than I have. And I just would uh, repeat what Mr. Fox said, that it's very frustrating that the state and the federal government haven't prioritized things like really valuable testing, because I know in other countries and other places, there have been ways to do it, but it has not been a priority here. So um, thank you for your choices here. I, I think thank you. Okay, Eric, I agree with you. I think all of our efforts should be into um, vaccinating people and you know the snowball's getting a little bit bigger with the vaccines but until it's a really big snowball we uh we've got work to do so moving on to bhs program of studies um yes ma'am um mr foss did you have a question that i see your hand or are you all set i'm all set thank you okay um uh, we have mark and joe here so i'll turn it over to um so Mark will explain a little bit about uh, the program of studies process, and then, um, and again, this is a first reading, so um, we'll this will be on the next agenda as well for for approval. So 
Mark. <clears throat> good evening, uh, everybody. It's good to see you again. Um, so, like Dr. Conti mentioned, um, we, uh, Joe and I, uh, every January are here uh, presenting uh, our program of studies for the next school year. So, this is for the 21-22 um, uh, school year next year. Uh, the process starts in the fall, really, um, end of September, early October. Uh, Joe and I start working with the department chairs uh, here at the high school. Um, individually, the departments with their teachers review um, their course offerings, their course descriptions, uh, and we ask them to update, modify, uh, and make recommendations for um, deletions and additions to the various courses that they offer. Um, we have individual meetings with the department heads, um, October, November timeframe. Um, and then from that point until now, um, most, of, most of Joe's work is putting the all the department's pieces into the big program, uh, which you have in draft form uh, tonight. Um, this is kind of a slow year for us. Typically, we um, have a pretty robust um, catalog of new uh, courses that teachers are thinking about and department chairs are advocating in their different departments. I think given um, the circumstances of this year and the pandemic, and uh, I think the stress that everybody is feeling, uh, there weren't as many um, modifications and additions this year. So uh, I think this will be one of our uh, quicker presentations to date, which I think everybody might appreciate tonight. Um, so in terms of uh, new courses that are, are being offered, um, th there's really uh, just one and it's uh, in the uh, English department. It's called the uh, Graphic Narratives, the Refugee Experience. Um, this is an elective class that students can choose to take uh, and it centers on the exploration of various newcomers experiences in the United States uh, through reading and discussion of graphic narratives. Uh, readings and coursework allow students to investigate real world problems faced by immigrants and refugees, uh, learn about the refugee crisis and work directly with professionals uh, who assist newcomers to the United States. Um, the English department and the department chair really felt this course is um, is timely and relevant given um, what's, what's happening in our country and it's something that students would be uh, interested in learning about. So it will be an offering, uh, if approved, um, a, a half year course, two and a half credits um, at the honors and college prep level uh, if students chose to um, sign up for that. Uh, you'll see a new class, but it's really a continuation of um, classes that we've been building upon since we moved to a foundation level uh, for our special education students a couple of years ago. Uh, the foundation physical science class is for sophomores uh, and juniors as they transition through their uh, course offerings. Uh, and just as a reminder, the foundation level courses at Burlington High School um, are for students who require um, highly modified uh, curriculums. Uh, a lot of times they're co-taught classes with two teachers uh, in there for students on individualized uh, educational plans. Uh, we're only taking one course out of the catalog this year and it's reasoning and argumentation. This was an interdisciplinary course that we uh, ran for several years between the math and social studies department. Um, one teacher from each department would take uh, one half of the year for the class. Uh, and unfortunately, um, the enrollment in the class other than the first year had really been declining to a point where um, we felt it was a time to take it out because the interest uh, to run it wasn't there, and it was taking uh, two teachers from the department, which was creating some schedule uh, conflicts as well. Uh, some modifications in the program, um, no changes to the courses, really. These are just uh, in name, um, narratives of self. Uh, it was previously literature and society, uh, a junior and senior English foundation level class, a uh, basic um, business and cons consumer economics, which was previously called college topics. Um, and you'll see several uh, several others. One is Modern America, uh, used to be called 1972 to present. Again, those aren't any um, major changes to the classes, but just uh, changes to the names. Um, and then also intro to programming, uh, in addition to college prep, will offer at the honors level uh, next year. Joe, you wanna jump in? Sure, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, just going to jump right in, uh, pick up where Mr. Sullivan left off uh, in terms of some of the, the modifications that are happening uh, within our art department. 
we are now alternating courses, uh, certain courses every other year. Not all courses necessarily have enough numbers to run or enough staffing to run it. So, um, for example, architecture is a course that ran this year, um, and that will be that will run in alternate years. So, uh, next year, web design and fashion design will run. Those two courses did not run this year. Mr. Ratkovich really tries to do a good job, and I think he does do a good job of communicating to students um, the alternating courses. So if I'm a if I'm a freshman and I really want to take architecture next year as a sophomore, uh, I know I'll have I'll have to wait until the following year. So he really tries to um, make students aware of some of the those changes. Dual enrollment uh, for the for the new school committee members. I'm sure you've heard of it, but. Just to elaborate on it a little bit, we have a dual enrollment program here at the high school, and it's um, the program is starting to pick up speed. We are adding more courses, and so dual enrollment it means that <clears throat> our current Burlington High School teachers also become an adjunct professor. Again, this was a model that uh, Dr. Conti was familiar with in his previous district many years ago now, but students were graduating high school with uh, college credits up to 30 college credits. We'd love to be able to get there. So essentially our current Burlington high school teachers also become adjunct pr professors at Middlesex community college. Their curriculum is reviewed. And the course is approved and so students can assuming they meet a few prerequisites can sign up for a Burlington high school class and potentially get dual enrollment credit with Middlesex. So we have added. Uh, AP computer science, honors computer science principles, and AP environmental science to that list is great. So um, just to get an understanding of how this is having an impact, we'll have students graduate um, with between 15 and 20 college credits. So we're getting there. Um, there's different advantages to this. One certainly is a, if a student gets college credit, um, they could finish college earlier. They could take one less class or two less classes in their freshman year, um, which can be which can be an advantage. Um, and again, it could ultimately save money if they want to graduate earlier. Students could use the flexibility of these extra credits to take a, a minor in something in something else. So it allows for some opportunity to take some courses they may otherwise not have the opportunity to take. So. The, the program is growing and we do have a section in our program of studies. And students are applying throughout the year. Other classes that we have are listed in the program of studies, but calculus, Latin. Um, English AP English uh, and, a, and a few others, so I would encourage you to check that out. So that's our dual enrollment program. And again, the reason we're mentioning it mentioning it again is we have a couple of new classes that have been added to our repertoire, repertoire of dual enrollment. And if anyone wants to jump in with questions, feel free. Computer science, we've just made some, some minor adjustments. Um, you'd have to look in the program to see specifically the changes, but they have changed how they explain courses to students. They, uh, the computer science department, I think, wants to try to encourage non-computer science students to participate in the program. And so I'll, I think there's a there's a feeling that when certain students hear computer science, they think it's very technical and maybe more science and math related. A computer science department's really trying to say that's not the case. We have some exploring computer science classes that give you the opportunity to get an under, understanding of what computer science is like, what it entails. So they're really trying to communicate that with some of the updates they've made in the program of studies, and they plan to um, share this not only with the high school students, but with the eighth graders in a couple of weeks. Just, we talked about MCAS earlier, and also I, we had mentioned 99% of the high school seniors have passed, but they, this Department of uh, Education has modified the requirement in terms of the test. Current, and we've added this to our program of studies, but students in the class of um, 2021, again, they need to take a, an MCAS approved course. Uh, right now, class of 2022 has yet to take their math and English MCAS. So 
Jesse has told us at some point they will need to take it. Uh, and we're, we're waiting to hear on more details of that. In terms of the science MCAS requirement, and again, we've added this to the program of studies, for current sophomores, juniors, and seniors, there is no longer a requirement to take a specific test in order to uh, in, in, or, in order to pass the MCAS. So now instead of a test, students will need to take an MCAS approved course. And that would be for current sophomores, juniors, and seniors. The state right now is telling us that current freshmen will need to take uh, an actual test. So we just included this in our program of studies where it is tied to a graduation requirement. And it's always been in the program, but we just updated it to reflect the, the current standards. Again, as Dr. Conti said, things could change. So, but we wanna try to stay as up to date as possible. Standardized testing, I know everyone has an opinion on standardized testing, but I think obviously it's still our responsibility to uh, offer it at the high school. And so we had to cancel SATs all fall. Fortunately, we were able, for those seniors, we were able to off offer something called an SAD, SAT school day test, which really worked out well for those seniors that did want to take the test, didn't have a chance to. Um, so we are liking the, the school day test. We're trying not to impact learning uh, within the school, but it, it is easier for our students, and it's not like an everyday thing. It's once every couple of months. As an example, we are gonna offer a PSAT school day test uh, coming up on January 26th, that's optional. And our juniors will have the opportunity to take that. We're gonna offer a PSAT for sophomores in the spring. And we plan on having a school day SAT for our juniors. Again, we just wanna be able to give them the option to take the SAT because of the pandemic. Um, hundreds of schools canceled SAT, so students weren't able to do that. One other COVID related, uh, one other COVID related thing that we've added to our school profile and our transcript is how we uh, finished up the year grading wise. We heard from colleges that assured us, and we believe them, that you know, however the grading, however schools ended last year, um, the colleges just said, "Let us know what you did. Tell us how you calculated grades and so on and so forth." So. We did include that information. Um, it's now on our transcript and it is also in our program of studies. And the last thing I'll mention is just um, again, this is for the newer school committee members, but we do we don't print a uh, hard copy program of studies for all students. But we we used to do that um, years ago. So now the program of studies is in a couple versions on the school website. We have a a standard PDF version. And then we also have um, a version that's, I would say more user-friendly. Lauren Vino's done a tremendous amount of work to make it more user-friendly on the website. And so um, you can check that out to see this year's program of studies. Once this is has the final read at the next school committee meeting, we would go ahead and update all the websites to reflect the new program of study. So I wanted to make sure you are aware uh, we will provide, we do have a limited number of hard copies. All the teachers get a hard copy and there's um, hard copies in class as well. So students can access it that way. Okay, uh, any questions? Martha. Um, I just um, wanted to ask on the, I'm really delighted we have this, uh, this basic business and consumer economics class. I, I don't, I was wondering what kind of enrollment numbers you get for that class during the last couple of years. I'm sorry, which class was it? Basic business and consumer economics. It's li I understand that the courses that we're reading in this particular printout are only the ones where there have been changes and this was a name change, but I am just glad that it's there. It seems like it's going to be more accurate for students to know what is in it. And I'm wondering what the enrollment numbers have been for the last couple of years. I have to look at the specific numbers, but um, it was actually a new course last year called College Topics of Business. Yeah. So the population, if that's the right word, that the business department is trying to capture 
with that class would be upperclassmen, juniors and seniors that have never taken a business course. Mm -hmm. um, I think they felt most of the juniors and seniors that participate in the business, pro business program have been in the program since freshman year. So they're trying to capture a group of students that that can experience a business class, not necessarily at a honors level, at a college prep level. And so the course ran, we have, I believe, one section this year it between 15 and 20 students. And now uh, we plan to hopefully offer it again and have the opportunity to take students to take that class. Good. Um, and then um, on the MCAS graduation requirement update, um, what does the CD stand for? I know the MCAS Com is competency determination. Competency determination, okay. Okay, and I think they've changed. I don't know if they're doing it again this year, but they um, they changed some of the language last spring to a portfolio review. So kind of what Joe was mentioning, they'd look at uh, if you had a student that didn't didn't pass, they'd look at the classes you were taking or the portfolio of your uh, academic courses um, to make sure that they were MCAS preparatory types of classes. Uh, and if you had a passing grade, they they would um, that would be the equivalent of a, a passing score in the MCAS. Okay. My last question, um, you were commenting on the online program of studies and one is a PDF and the other is you felt more user friendly. Is it also uh, ADA accessible? Is it available for people with vision impairment and other types of issues that might make it hard to access? Uh, yes, uh, I think the, the new website fortunately is ADA compliant. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Conti. And one of the reasons Lauren Vino a lot, uh, worked with us to put the program of studies on the website was just for that for that reason. Good, thank you. Anyone else have questions? Um, I have a quick one. So last year we made some changes relative to AP uh, Bio and Chem. Those haven't been touched, correct? No, correct. Okay. And the, and the exactly. um, what? Both though, everything's staying the same. Okay, and then on the new physical science course, is that an option that's being put in for kids after they take bio in case they don't choose to go straight to chem or physics? Yeah, exactly. So. A bio student in, in sophomore year will choose chemistry or physical science. We already are running this year the, the college prep physical science, um, but we'll be adding the foundational level next year. Okay, but they can still go into chemistry or physics, right? Without that, without taking that course. Correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's all. Um, we can move on if it, unless anyone else has questions. I, I just wanted to add a couple of things quick and, and, I'm sorry. I, just, and I um i just we were going to add some things in for this year but we decided not to so i just wanted to preview a couple of things uh that you can anticipate for next uh, next january um one is uh we're going to start a process this week uh, we're going to be asking for uh, staff student and some parent volunteers uh, to look at our graduation requirement around uh, the exploratory requirement um, it used to be five to nine hundred requirement years ago. Yeah, um, really. So that might be one of the options on the table. Um, so I, I think we, we want to, and I think it's good every several years to look at it to make sure that uh, our students have the choice and opportunity to take uh, a variety of classes and have a well balanced experience at the high school. Um, so we will begin the process this year. Uh, into uh, next fall, um, and hopefully we'll have a recommendation for a change in the program next January. Uh, that would impact the current seventh grade class when they entered uh, Burlington High School, so it would be um, a year and a half from now. Um, the English department is also looking at piloting something called embedded honors. Um, it's something that we'd look to, we would look to phase in, possibly as a pilot. Um, but embedded honors is uh, essentially a heterogeneous grouping of college prep and honors level um, uh, uh, students uh, where every student has the chance to earn honors level credit uh, based upon coursework, taking leadership roles, taking initiative for their own learning. Um, 
and you'd have the choice to be able to do it. So it's a model that we're potentially looking at to pilot in certain departments that you could uh, expect to possibly see next January. Uh, and then the social studies uh, standards are changing uh, pretty significantly. And I know the department, uh, Mr. Witten and his teachers have done a lot of work uh, and are gonna continue that over the uh, course of the next year. Uh, there'll be some uh, fairly significant changes potentially to the social studies curriculum at the high school uh, for next January. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, if all goes as planned and we are opening up as normal next fall, uh, we will uh, still be implementing our new schedule that we were supposed to start this past September. Uh, that obviously got derailed. Um, I've presented it several times uh, here at the committee. It's, it feels like it's been a four year process to get it off the ground at this point. But um, just as a reminder, that modified block schedule uh, that included the flex and advisory time um, is still uh, being prepared and ready to go for next fall, um, assuming that we are um, prepared to open uh, under normal conditions. So I just wanted to add those few things in as a preview of, of some things to come. All right, thanks. I'm glad you're looking at the 500 to 900 because I've never heard a positive thing from the students about it. Um, they need, they, they're so restricted in what they um, have for time that to force them to take a course they don't want is tough. Um, Martha. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan. Um, I was wondering, I thought I had heard, did any of the advisories start this year? And so that were the teachers who were concerned about getting the kind of resources and support they needed, was that put in place or is that? I'm sorry, I'm sorry Ms. Simon, you were breaking up. I don't know if I. I'm sorry. Uh, let me try again. Um, I know you 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 just said you're going to have a new new schedule and the advisories next September. I thought I'd heard something about the advisories starting this year. Is that true? And if so, whenever they start now or next year, I, I know there were some teachers who were concerned about getting the resources and the supports they needed for that. Yes, you 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 did hear that correct. We, um, Mr. Jackling and a group of teachers. Um, worked uh, last spring over the summer and even into the fall, they're still working now putting an advisory curriculum together. Uh, it was, it's up and ready. It was ready to go in September. Um, hindsight being 2020, we waited till the last day of professional development to present it to um, staff. And I think it was very uh, overwhelming and it was bad timing to try to implement something brand new given um, the new schedule and dealing with hybrid and remote and everything else that was happening. Uh, so we made the decision to wait. Um, and I think the, the biggest reason we made that decision was because we all want that program to be successful. Um, and I don't think staff was ready. Um, so we, we, we paused, uh, the Tuesday and Friday afternoons was where that time was going to be. So it didn't, I know we already have a loss of instructional time this year, but that's where it was going to go. Uh, which is why those two days are now um, not full days with a 1230 dismissal, um, but it is ready to go. Uh, the plan is to work with staff over the spring and summer um, and under the new schedule, we'll have it ready to go in September. Thank you. So we did pilot also, um, we are sharing some of the resources. Um, we started last month with staff as optional activities that they can do in their class, uh, as well as uh, we presented the, um, mental health um, resources and wellness resources last time that we were here with Chrissy uh, misconception. Um, so we are sharing those resources out now uh, through Google Classroom with all staff to get them familiar with it and uh, are encouraging them to use some of the lessons with their kids now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, um, <clears throat> forward. Uh, <clears throat> I felt I feel obliged to respond to the chair's comments about the 500 900 series. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to reinforce my support for the liberal arts education. I think there's plenty of time for people to specialize in things as they get older. Uh, it's a very good thing, I believe, to have people experience and to be exposed to all different subject matters. And so I hope you, as you have your meetings going forward to, to, um, to work on that particular area. Uh, I hope you're not looking to can it. I just hope you're looking to improve it. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, okay. 
Next item is uh, school choice first reading, Dr. Conti. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm glad Mark is here so he doesn't have to um, uh, come back. So um, again, we've been doing the uh, school choice program, which requires a public hearing. Um, we're, this is not the public hearing tonight. Uh, we have to advertise in the paper, which uh, Sharon will will take care of. We just wanted to, um, while Mark and Joe were here, to inform the committee um, what we're asking for in terms of uh, school choice, so almost as a first reading. We'll do the proper advertising, and then when the school committee takes their vote to approve, it'll be uh, during a, a, a future um, uh, public, uh, public hearing. So, um, Again, typically we've um, allowed the um, high school to open up spots, uh, 10 freshman spots, and then five sophomore, five junior, and five senior. And um, again, we traditionally, um, I'm not sure we've used all of them, but it gives the high school some flexibility to, um, I think, better serve, better serve students. So Mark, do you want to, um, um, make the request uh, of the committee, and then we'll make sure that the public hearing takes place and the vote happens at a future meeting. Sure. I, I would um, respectfully request that the committee approve uh, the school choice program again for the 21-22 uh, school year. Um, like Dr. Conti mentioned, we, we typically don't fill all our spots this year. Uh, our freshman class has uh, five. Our sophomore class has five um six at the junior grade and we have eight seniors under the program um so we, we we typically don't fill all the spots it allows us a lot of times to service burlington kids who grow up here and uh, maybe move at sophomore or junior year in high school and it allows them to stay um so we have been able to support a lot of burlington kids through the program um as well as uh, burlington staff members and we only uh, fill the spots after all of our Burlington students are fully uh, fully scheduled. Uh, so we don't open up any new spots at the freshman level until we know that we have the space and that we can accommodate uh, the kids. And uh, at that particular time, even though we could go to 10, if we know we only had space for four, uh, that would be our cap for that particular year. So we would never displace or uh, overextend a Burlington class to accommodate uh, anybody in the school choice program. Okay. So at the next meeting, we have a public hearing and um, I don't think there'll be any difficulty in supporting the request. It seems to have worked out very well <clears throat> for all the years you've been doing it now. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, what, probably, um, year 13, I think. So 12 or 12 or 13, so. Um, um, so yes, it has worked out well. Okay, um, on to parent survey results. Um, again, thank you, Madam Chair. We did uh, survey parents prior to the uh, winter break in regards to whether they wanted their um, children to um, switch their mode of instruction. Um, and um, the I think Patrick is, is um, is joining us or will quickly join us um okay. i know he's, you are excellent so with that i'll turn it over to patrick and he can talk uh, a little bit more specifically about uh about the numbers uh the high school is a bit of an outlier so uh, when we do the high school at the end again mark you're going to stay with us to to do that with joe uh i can yeah that'd be great so patrick go ahead sure thank you um good, e good evening everybody happy new year um I just, it was amazing. I think uh, it was a testament to the amazing work of our teachers and we, you know, that people are so happy in this uncertain circumstance um, with what's happened for the first half of the year um, that we had so few requests. Cause I think if people aren't happy with what's happening we would have seen more. So um, at the elementary level we had, I think the final number was 10 that switched from hybrid to remote. And then we had 17 that went from remote to hybrid. So 27 kids out of over 1,600 elementary students um, switched. I'm no math major, but that's a pretty damn good percentage, pardon my language, um, again, because I think it is a testament to the, the work our teachers have done in incredibly trying circumstances. Um, 
18 middle school families requesting changes for their students. Um, and Carrie was actually able to make those changes pretty quickly. Uh, most of our elementary switches took place this Monday. There's a couple that will take place next week. Um, and all of the um, middle school students that wanted to switch were able to be accommodated um, the Monday right after we, the first Monday we came back. So um, again, those numbers are incredible to me. I think when we sent the survey out, we were, we were kind of not sure what to expect. So again, just can't say enough about the work of uh, teachers in the classrooms. And again, thanks to uh, the families for being so flexible. We know it's not um, a perfect experience this year, but I know we're, we're doing a great job within the parameters that we have. So um, the, the high school, I think Mark's final number was, or originally, I know this conversation's ongoing, so I don't wanna speak for you, Mark. Do you wanna talk sure. about the high school? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we had uh, approximately 50 students that expressed uh, interest in moving one way or the other, mostly um, hybrid to remote. Uh, so Joe uh, is in the process now of individually meeting um, with all those families. Um, 25 or so, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, have decided to stay in the hybrid model. Um, we have 12 currently that are still going to go remote and we're working on those schedules now. Uh, and we're still, um, a few kids wanted to come back to hybrid, which we were able to accommodate right away. Uh, and we're still working on scheduling uh, meetings with some of the other families who expressed an interest. Um, the way our high school schedule is set up is they're two completely different um, schedules. So you can't, uh, you don't necessarily keep all your same teachers. I know um, Sarah mentioned virtual high school earlier. Um, th that's no longer an option because that's a closed enrollment. It was only open in the fall. Um, a vast majority of those classes are being used for electives, not, not core classes. I just wanna make that clear that um, most of our remote students are fully scheduled in core classes with Burlington teachers. Um, there are some outliers. I think there's one English kid and uh, AP economics, AP stats is a couple of outliers that are core classes, but uh, a vast majority uh, are in core classes with Burlington teachers. Uh, the virtual high school, like we typically use it, is used to augment the program of studies for electives. And that's what most of our kids are enrolled in uh, currently now. Uh, we also use Edgenuity, which could be an option. They have a, um, a rolling enrollment. Um, but uh, again, those are asynchronous types of classes where the kids that get the content and then they might have like a weekly check in with the teacher uh, that is running the course. Um, so we're in the process. We had um, committed to making those changes at the semester point, which is the 28th of January. Um, and I think we'll be right on track for that with um, being able to accommodate almost everybody who wanted to uh, make a change. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, any, any more on that topic? Any uh, questions? Just a, a couple of things, Madam Chair, quickly. Um, uh, we're probably not going to um, make changes again, depending on how the spring un unfolds. Um, um, and I'm never going to say never, given the environment that we're in, because things could change uh, completely um, 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 from week to week. So, um, but I do think I want to echo what Patrick said. I, I think uh, our teachers have been making uh, the remote experience and the hybrid experience positive. I think parents really value the relationship that their students had have developed with their with their teachers. And I think many did not want to change that um, that established relationship. I think that's a real strength in Burlington, a strength of our teachers. And I think if um, if you um, remember anything that I sort of talk about, which I know can be um, unending, the, um, we really talked about the importance of those relationships, uh, establishing those relationships in the fall. And, and I think um, if you need any evidence that those relationships have been established and are strong, um, I, I think the um, relatively low number of people wanting to develop that relationship is, is, um, is a measure of that. Um, the only other thing that I wanna stress because um, where, where there's a little bit of, um, uh, of, a, of a challenge is we, the expectation when students are in a hybrid schedule is that they come to school and that they attend school in person. So um, we know there are reasons for students who um, can't attend, um, 
And I think if the if those reasons, if the parents are supportive of, of those reasons, then the students can certainly be absent from a hybrid schedule, not show up to class and still access their class um, through live streaming or, or remotely. So uh, we're still responsible for student attendance. And what we're asking for, and I think what we're being a little bit more careful about is that uh, students have an excused reason for not coming to school. Uh, they can't just not show up because they don't wanna show up and they can't just not show up because uh, they're traveling or they're doing, or they're doing something, um, something else. Um, there are districts that surround us that if a student who's in a hybrid schedule doesn't show up for uh, a certain number of days, the school is actually unenrolling that student. And that's not what we're talking about, but I do wanna say that the expectation if a student's in a hybrid schedule is that they show up to school, and if they don't show up to school, um, there needs to be uh, an excused reason. The parent needs to um, contact the school and then we'll do our best to um, adjust and allow that student to access their class again, unless they're really sick and they, and they, can't, um, and they can't learn for that day. So um, again, we're, we're, um, um, we, we, again, hybrid schedules mean you, you come to school. Mark, I'm not sure if you wanna add anything to that. Uh, no, I, I think you said it fine. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, if a kid's not feeling well and needs to be home, that's fine. But we have some kids who, um, you know, three, four, five, six weeks because the cases are spiking or they're not comfortable coming. And unfortunately, the way the classes are working, there is a lot of live streaming happening. But with limited in-person instruction, um, it is important that those kids attend the classes with their teachers in their, on their hybrid days. Um, not every kid will fall behind, but um, I think universally it's important that we get the kids into school uh, and in front of those teachers as, as much as possible. So um, we are working individually with families. Like you said, I know some districts are limiting the ability to even live stream if they're on their hybrid days. They're saying that you can only do asynchronous work um, and then you can access the live stream on your remote days. Uh, I'm not saying that we need to, to do that yet. Um, but we really do need to encourage kids to be there on their hybrid days to make sure that they're not missing that in-person instruction. Okay, the message is parents on the hybrid days, if your kids are well, send them to school. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'd like to make sure the committee gets theirs answered first. So does anyone on the committee have questions? Um, okay, so what I want to know is, and, and you sort of veered off, this is tan, uh, tangent to the um, actual discussion of the parent survey, but uh, are you looking at, you know, it's only January and more and more people now with the changes are getting vaccinated. Um, if the numbers begin to go down are you looking at changes a longer day for the uh, elementary and maybe getting kids back in school more days in a week and i hope the answer is not no answer is yes so mrs monaco i'm always looking to expand the in-person time i just don't think the time to do that is is now with increasing rates i think we have a, a, a sort of a, a good management system in place i think people are are comfortable and uh, we're not seeing um, school cases uh, spiking. So um, I just want to, um, again, stay, stay where we are. But if um, we're seeing um, more folks um, vaccinated, if they prioritize educators, which they say that they are, um, the commissioner's conversation on Friday, you know, the window was February to April for, um, for rolling out the vaccine for educators. That's a pretty big window mm -hmm. so um if it's more like february or march then i would see us uh, expanding earlier if it doesn't happen till later in the spring then then uh, we'll we'll look at what the positivity rates are and and what the options are so we're always trying to expand that mrs monaco and and uh, i i know that's uh, important yes thank you um i hope that it'll happen rather quickly now and that we can get the kids back for more time in school. And and the it's expanding the elementary, same answer. Expanding as soon elementary as you're comfortable is, uh, with it. I'm sorry? As soon as you're comfortable that you can do it, you'll do it. 
Yeah, uh, again, the, the elementary isn't that much about uh, learning time. It's really going to be about um, the time that we would be adding would be, um, I think there would only be an additional 45 minutes that we're doing remotely now. The rest of the time would be for lunch and recess. So um, we just have to look at transportation, um, managing um, lunch and recess, and then, and then uh, the remote. But uh, I think the elementary schedule is working uh, very well right now. I think we have kids in five days a week, which is... Um, not something that's occurring in many districts. And uh, I just want to make sure we, we continue to um, practice our protocols and, uh, and make sure this, our schools stay open. So, um, so that's, that's sort of where I'm, where I'm thinking right now. Okay, I just, I, I just want to keep encouraging you to think about sending kids back as soon as it's safe. Um, some, did, Tom, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Um, one other thing I just want to mention on this sort of on not really on this topic, but um, I had asked Eric and Patrick to look at doing a survey on on um, on full day kindergarten at the request of some parents. Um, is there, you are going to do something, right? You're going to either put a survey or come up with a plan or do something. Mrs. Monaco, I'm not sure I've ignored too many of your requests. So uh, <laughs> I don't think you've ignored any of them, Eric, ever. So, uh, I, I, I don't think I will ignore this one. I think we'll work at it. We want to include our, our kindergarten teachers, our elementary principals. What I'd like to do is um, work through some of what the scheduling challenges would be and put together a realistic um, um, again, a, a realistic day, and then look at any of the budgetary impact of that, because there there may be some um, some challenges. It's not going to be that big of a change for us because we we have what's considered a full day already from the state. Uh, we would just need to add uh, a specialist time, um, but um, it it may impact some uh, transportation challenges. We may actually save some money in transportation, but. Um, we just have to work through some details and then uh, we will survey elementary families and preschool families um, about uh, about the possibility. All right, thank you. I just wanted people to know that it's it's really something we're taking seriously. Um, do you want to move on to the school building facilities update? Um, yes, I do. So uh, Mark and Joe, I think we're we're all set. so thank you very much. and um, I think the um, it's it's just been a, it's been a, a challenging year, and I think the thought you put into the program of studies and the courses is um, is um, is is great given the year that we've had. So again, thank you very much. Please thank your department heads and and, and the staff for all the work they put in. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, thank, thank you, Mark and Joe. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, so I do have a couple of things to update you all on. Uh, I'll try to keep it quick, but of course, um, I'll field any questions that come up. Um, first, let me start with two larger projects going on in the district right now. Um, one is the gym floor. Uh, I can say that they put the first coat of polyurethane on yesterday, um, striping today. Um, and again, I think the expectation is um, we're days away from having a finished floor. Uh, once they start putting that polyurethane on, is that really good sign? Again, all the floors installed, bleaches installed. Um, and like I said, just really finishing up the graphics and then two more coats of polyurethane and we're done. So um, getting close to being able to update you all with uh, we are done with that project. Uh, the second uh, large project is the middle school boiler. Um, this is a warrant article. Uh, we do have three boilers at the middle school, so again, we're not without heat, um, but that one is actually underway right now, the replacement of that. Um, I'm going to jump on to a project that we had discussed previously. Um, that's the proposal from our architectural firm that uh, we are in contract with. Um, obviously, during the holiday time frame, uh, there was a little bit of shortcomings as far as meeting times and so forth, um, but we did manage to meet. Uh, we actually did a tour of the building as well, too. Um, so, again, I'm waiting on that, but I think that's close for us to have that proposal uh, to be able to discuss that. Next, um, 
I was presented with the opportunity of a grant that's coming from the uh, electric company and potentially the gas company. And um, we're seeing if we're actually eligible for it. And what it is, is um, it would not be a full boiler or heating system replacement, uh, but there are some management controls and management devices um, that we may be eligible for to install in our buildings. Um, it would allow us remote management, uh, remote shutdown, turn on, um, adjust the temperatures and so forth remotely. Uh, and then there's a smart component as well too, um, which looks at similar to um, some, some home devices. And it looks at how long it takes to ramp up and heat up a space, cool down a space, all in the effort of, of saving energy and, and being more efficient. Um, so we just met recently this week uh, and did a tour of four of our buildings. Um, and then we've provided them some information. So right now we're just, we're looking to uh, complete that application to see if we are eligible. Uh, I did want to remind everybody again that MSBA project um, for the high school or anything else that we may choose to submit um, was pushed back. So it's not going to be the April deadline. Um, it's looking more towards the summer in the July timeframe as of now. Um, but we still have submitted already in the previous year for the Fox Hill. Uh, and we do have a meeting coming up um, at the end of the month uh, to discuss that as well, too. So um, we'll see how that meeting goes. And that's not at all saying that we have the project. It's just a follow up meeting um, just to discuss some, some conversations about that. Um, recently, I just sent you all a preliminary uh, ventilation report. Um, first, I need to say that um, Ed Parsons and Mike Walters, um, two residents in Burlington, parents in Burlington, um, they have been volunteering a lot of time. We've been having weekly meetings, exchanging emails, um, phone calls. They've been running reports and doing tests. Um, they've taken turns coming in person to help with testing and uh, really just the effort uh, and a collaboration to get some of this testing done um, and then provide you all with a, a first draft of that report. Um, it's definitely something that we do want to get out to the community. We want to get it out to the teachers. Um, if I could summarize it, and when I say summarize it, this is a baby, baby summarize of it. Um, it basically explains what happened in August, how we started off with some machines that weren't really operating at their best. Uh, we then um, come to the point where we're at right now, the changes that we've made, the fixes and repairs that we've put in place, the HEPA filters that we've purchased and installed in the rooms, the CO2 testing, uh, the data up from that CO2 testing. Um, again, we have some newer buildings. Uh, the newer buildings definitely have some great airflow. Uh, our older buildings um, have good to great airflow. Um, and I think the main point of the report um, is to basically say to everybody that we're making tracking and we're making and tracking all of the changes that we're doing in our buildings. Um, we're providing elements to make sure people have fresh air in the buildings. And even though we have some older buildings and older machines, um, the air quality, the air changes, uh, the guidance from the state, um, we're meeting those requirements um, in any places that we're not. Um, we're repairing it or supplementing it as we can be or displacing people um, into other spaces. So um, we just need to constantly remind, you know, the staff and the residents that we didn't take this measurement or any of COVID or HVAC testing lightly. Um, and there's a lot of effort going in with our maintenance staff, custodial staff. Um, and again, you know, the volunteers that are helping us uh, to make sure that these machines are running to the best of their capabilities. So. Um, that's a, again, a summary. I'm sure we may want to bring that up at another meeting if we want to discuss it in depth. Um, I did notice that Ed Parson jumped on and I don't want to call him out. I just want to thank him publicly. Um, but again, if we would like to schedule something, or if you have some questions for me, uh, I'd love to discuss it. But that's all I got for right now. Bob, why don't we put it on a future agenda that we can uh, spend some time with it and, and we'll, um, we can actually go through it and give people a chance to uh, review it. I think you just got it out to folks uh, this last week. So, um, yeah. so if we can, we can do that. So um, Madam Chair, if that's okay with you, we'll put it on um, maybe uh, next on the next agenda. 
Sure. Um, Ed's on the call if you want to just ask him. Well, Ed, again, I'll say thank you first. So thank you for all your support and, and your help. I know you're you're putting in a lot of time. Is is there anything you want to mention about the report? No, you're welcome. Uh, I think that uh, we just wanted to provide some unity to the efforts um, that have been going on and, and explain everything, um, as well as explain our conclusions. And we've triangulated uh, from a variety of uh, data sources and methods, and we get um, uh, results that agree. Uh, we set a reasonable limit that uh, uh, has been recapitulated by um, professional societies um, by the TH uh, Chan School at Harvard. Um, and we met that um, in some spaces, it's with some effort, um, but we have to remain diligent and I think we'll continue to uh, to meet those standards and provide a, a good layer of protection, among others, uh, to mitigate uh, risk of COVID transmission. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your input, Ed. Do you, um, do you have an interest in, in being part of the agenda at the next meeting? Um, uh, I would hope that the report uh, speaks for itself, and I think the plan is to release that publicly soon, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Sound good, Eric? Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for all your help. Uh, Martha, you have a question. Uh, mostly just want to thank, uh, first of all, Ed Parsons um, and the other fellow, Walter. I, I don't know. Mike, Mike Walters. Um, because I know it's been a huge amount of work that you've put in and, and really it is very appreciated. And you write a report that is accessible. I, you know, I am not an engineer, but I did read through most of it. And I felt like I understood what you were talking about. And I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Kuna, for all of what you've been working on. I know you worked on it just as hard as they did. Um, and I also want to thank you for keeping um, the other projects on your plate, because I know that you could spend probably all your time working on the HVAC with trying to keep our schools safe from the virus in the air. But um, I really appreciate that you're continuing to keep up with all the other projects, with the idea of, you know, keeping the, the high school renovation moving forward, you know, keeping in touch with MSBA. So I want to thank you all. And I'm sure there are other people behind the scenes, so if you could thank them as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there uh, more on school building facilities or are we done? Um, no, that, that's all I really wanted to get to now. Uh, I do just want to add briefly what Martha just mentioned. Um, Yes, there's there's well more behind me, uh, my staff, uh, the staff in Burlington Public Schools, of course, uh, the maintenance shop, the custodians. Um, they're putting in a tremendous amount of effort, as are you know the teachers and clerical and cafeteria as well too. But um, definitely, yes, there's a lot going on project and building wise. So I definitely just want to thank them. Yeah, there's a lot of people to thank. Okay. Uh, if that's it, we'll move on to uh, communication, monthly financial update. Nicole? Um, uh, I'm going to be doing the monthly financial update, Chris. Um, I think um, Nicole is having some connectivity issues. So, I'm on here, Eric. You oh, you are? are? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, Hi, um, Nicole. Hi. So I, I think Bob's going to um, share it up on the screen so everyone everyone can see. I'm going to start with um, our typical financial update, and then I'll, I'll move into um, that the special request for our, our COVID expenses. Um, and again, for the sake of time, uh, I'd just like to um, review the, the few highlights that I think that everyone will be looking at. Um, the first, of course, being um, our revolving fund summary, our school lunch. Um, our deficit uh, currently stands at $178,729. Um, but this is just reflecting that our reimbursements have only been received through the month of November. Um, in a typical month, um, for the, the past few months since schools reopened, 
um, under the, the new program for um, school lunch that we're operating um, with everyone being considered free lunch and um, the increase, increased reimbursement rate. Um, we're at about um, typically, you know, $70,000 $70, um, per month. Obviously, December we had a um, some, some school breaks in there, so I don't anticipate it for our um, our receipts to be quite as much uh, for the month of December. Um, as I've mentioned in previous months, the uh, the town has set aside about a hundred thousand um, in their COVID. Uh, relief funds uh, to help offset this deficit as we've experienced um, an increase in both, um, you know, the packaging of, of lunches and um, the, the labor to do so um, for this program to run. <clears throat> so between um, the month of December reimbursement and um, the funds to for COVID relief to help offset it. Um, at 178,000, I'm, I'm genuinely not concerned right now um, with that number. I know it, it sounds like a big number, um, but I think that we have it covered where we stand right now. Um, the other um, revolving account here to note is the, the Sprouts Daycare that is also in a deficit right now, um, but we also did have three um, pay periods in um, this past month. Uh, so again, this is just sort of a, a timing difference between um, deductions being collected and, and the, the teachers in that program being paid. Um, unless anyone has any questions on this, I will move on to operating. Questions? Um, if I could, Madam Chair. Yeah, I can't see everybody. So when you put your hand up, I don't see it. So um, it's Martha Simon, and um, I actually talked offline with Nicole this week, and I uh, was concerned about the uh, school lunch deficit, and, and she explained it pretty well, but I want to just reinforce that we are offering free lunches because there is there is funding for that, and the reimbursement rate from the state or federal government, whoever is paying us for it, is has gone up, but it does not cover the cost of it. And so there are additional costs for extra labor to prepare meals to go and to distribute them. And there's extra costs for the packaging and those kinds of things. So I, I feel like, and, and where there are sources for, for this deficit right now, I do feel comfortable with it as, as knowing that Ms. Kasha does. But I just wanted to add that because it, it does still look, there are reasons for that deficit this year. Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to comment? Um, speak up if you do, because I can't see everyone's face. Okay. Um, ways and means. Uh, any questions from Raja or any other member? Um, uh, Ms. Roger, thank you. I don't. Nothing in particular. I mean, I appreciate the difficulty of the situation and um, given that we need to provide services, I think I ex accept Nicole's uh, somewhat confidence that it'll work itself out when the reimbursements catch up um, and that there's available funds to cover the shortage. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, Nicole, you can keep going. Okay, so uh, moving on to operating. Um, if you're looking at our, our prior month, um, we're down uh, roughly about, about 20,000 from, from our prior month. Uh, we did pick up a, a couple of additional sections at the high school, um, and, and that is the main cause of um, that difference there. So um, total operating uh, remaining budget is 205,000 in change. Um, as of right now, and um, for accommodated um, around um, $3,400, which um, has, hasn't changed significantly over um, the prior month. Okay, um, are there any questions for Nicole? Speak up if you have them, because I can't see you.
Not hearing any. Uh, anyone on Ways and Means have questions to Nicole on this? Okay, uh, looks like we're good. Is there any more, Nicole? Yeah, so um, at the last meeting, um, I know that it was it was requested that uh, we sort of give a brief overview of our our COVID spending. Yes. Um, and the funding that we received. Um, yes. So, Bob, um, if you could bring up on, on the screen um, the, the, the next page that I uh, send out to everyone. Um, so, basically, uh, we received two grants um, directly for COVID relief. Um, all the expenditures um, that were incurred uh, needed to be due to the public health emergency um, with respect to COVID-19 and meet all allowable use requirements specific to these grants. Um, and all of everything that we expend from these grants, you know, are, are monitored on the state and the federal level um, through mandated reporting out of my office, um, either on a monthly or quarterly basis. Um, so there, there's pretty heavy oversight here. Um, so for the, the two grants, um, the, the first that we received was uh, the ESSER, which is the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief uh, for 112000 And the second was the, um, the CBRF, which is the Coronavirus Relief Fund School Reopening Grant for $789,000. Um, below that, you'll see um, just broken out into to rough categories here. So uh, the first being uh, professional salaries, which are um, teachers. And um, 457,000 is, is what we spent um, out, of, out of that total um, on teachers, which was approximately seven teachers. Um, and this was comprised mostly of our remote academy. Um, so any teachers that were either budgeted for and removed and moved to remote academy, um, the, the teachers that then filled their place uh, in person um, is what we picked up here. Um, the second category you'll see here is uh, support salaries. So this is compromised of, um, of both IAs and um, tech support. Um, obviously with going um, with some remote and hybrid learning, uh, we needed additional, um, just additional hands-on uh, the help desk. So that 87,000 that you see here is um, what we've expended or expended and encumbered um, and projected to spend um, in that area. Um, three contracted services, um, 119,000 and materials and supplies, 239,000. Um, out of the contracted services, um, these expenses um, consisted of air quality assessments and testing that are ongoing. Um, a pandemic preparedness, compliance, and risk assessment, um, IT help desk and communications, um, software for remote and hybrid learning uh, amongst departments, and then the fourth category, which was the 239,000 um, materials and supplies. These expenses consisted of um, PPE, so mask, shields, gloves, gowns, um, whatever our staff needed in order to stay safe, um, also cleaning supplies uh, and electrostatic sprayers, um, building modification supplies um, to create our isolation rooms and protective glass at counters um, to protect, you know, our clerical staff that are encountering the public, um, hand sanitizer, HEPA filters, uh, signage for the buildings, and um, tents for outdoor learning. Um, so that those are the, the major categories and um, that we've spent our COVID relief funding on. All right, looks good. Um, does anyone have questions? I just, uh, Mr. Monaco, I, I just have a, a comment is the, um, the majority of the money, as you can see, we really spent on um, on teacher salaries. And there are lots of different ways for us to put our schedules together and um, Remember, uh, an option that we had coming out of the summer was to provide uh, remote instruction through a, uh, a service, uh, Florida Virtual School or Edgenuity, and we prioritized having Burlington kids taught by Burlington teachers, and I do think that's been uh, uh, well worth the, um, 
well worth the expense. And I, I think that, um, um, so I, again, I think our teachers have done a great job. And, and again, as evidenced by some of the things we've discussed tonight, but um, um, I think, again, everyone is comparing districts. I think districts made some different choices. Um, we, we invested in, um, in making sure that we had um, live teachers for kids uh, when, whenever we could. Good. Um, Martha asked me if you would um, please get these posted, both reports on the website. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Again, you have to speak uh, out. Yeah, Roger here. Okay, hi, Roger. Um, yeah, it's good to see this, this summary and the breakdown. I realize there may be not much information yet about the next relief package that was passed at the end of December. Um, do we have any particular expectations about other, you know, grants and other things to apply for to cover future expenses? Um, the chair. Go ahead, Nicole. Uh, so there, um, there was some information distributed um, this week regarding um, an ESSER grant number two, um, but at this time there's no concrete numbers associated with that funding. So while we know that something is in the pipeline, um, I, I'm not going to make any projections as to uh, what those numbers will look like, um, but there is something. Okay. I, yeah, I think know. It was a little how, it, how it came through. Um, so good, thanks. Let us know when you get it, okay, um, Nicole? Yeah, and let Roger know. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Nicole. I guess we're moving on to the um, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the update, Dr. Conti. Again, Patrick, can do this quickly. I think Sarah did a, a good job already, Patrick, um, going <laughs> going through it. But uh, um, um, how many applicants were we we're like at thirty seven, Patrick? Is that correct? Thirty eight. Thirty eight. So um, and uh, thirty eight applicants. The postings up till the end of the month, and uh, the interview committee should be getting together just prior to the end of the month. And uh, I want to thank Sarah and that working group from the equity committee that is already uh, proposing some questions for us. So that's part of uh, our initial meeting is to start to look at questions that we would ask the candidates. So I want to thank um, Jen Fine Chen and, uh, and the folks um, who are part of that working group. Madam Chair, with your permission, can we just go right to the professional development days since Patrick? Yes, go for it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we have our first of our two professional development days uh, for this month and the next one's two weeks from tomorrow. And um, variety of things happening. There's a couple of uh, schools that are gonna spend part of the day with ideas trainings. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of sessions on the MacBooks um, that the teachers were provided. So some training on the MacBooks and um, and then there's collaborative time for teachers. I know the principals are using it to check in with grade level teams or departments at um, the middle school and high school. And I'm um, just trying to provide a lot of flexibility. I know um, we really appreciate the, the more time for professional learning this year. Um, and we are trying to make sure that staff has time with um, things that we both consider priorities at this point. So we'll be surveying staff after tomorrow um, looking ahead to the uh, next January, and then we have two more in March. So again, um, again, I'll have more information next meeting as to how how things went, and we will have more MacBook trainings. And uh, the two schools that are doing ideas trainings are the uh, Memorial and the Fox Hill. So they're both going to have um, half of their day with ideas, um, both of the January days. So Patrick, just to, again, just to echo what you're saying, just for everyone, anyone watching, January 13th and January 27th, there's no learning. There's, there's, those are um, non-teaching days. So students are, um, are off uh, those two days. That is correct. So, All so right. Do that. So thank you. Um, Anything else on that? What? 
Anything else on that from anyone? No. Um, no, again, just uh, the days are normally front loaded with our uh, conference at the start of the year, but because of the the state shortened the year by 10 days and we use the uh, state's 10 professional development days, we have days um, now distributed throughout the year. So it's going to be interesting, Patrick, to talk to teachers about the, the format and, and some of the timing of things too, from a you know, from 10,000 feet to, to see how we want to maintain this, so. Yeah, and I've heard good things about the um, continuity that can be gained with the uh, Wednesday time that teachers have had as well, so. So I think that's uh, for all for future discussion. So thank you. Um, Madam Chair, may I move on? You may. Uh, the Student Opportunity Act, um, we added this to the agenda. Um, we've had lots of conversations about this uh, in the past. Um, the Student Opportunity Act was um, um, was a way to get more funding from the state to districts that needed it um, and that need it. Um, with the onset of the pandemic, um, the Student Opportunity Act um, has not been funded and it was delayed. Um, so if you remember back, um, the Student Opportunity Act money is not separate revenue. The money comes in through our Chapter 70, but it's just identified in a different way. So um, roughly Burlington is getting um, or slated to get $100,000 roughly. It might be $109,000 um, in Student Opportunity Act funds. Again, those aren't new dollars. Um, they're just coming in as a subset of our Chapter 70 and districts now have to tell the state how they're planning on spending um, that money. So um, it could be significant money for uh, other districts. So um, what I like that the state did is they created a sort of an application that's a long form for districts that may get $3 million, and they created a short form for districts like Burlington that are just getting a smaller dollar amount. The deadline for our Student Opportunity Act application is this Friday. Um, and I know we've already voted on this as a committee. I just wanted to take another vote just because I think the last one we took was about a year ago. And um, so I will tell you what we're spending the, the money on. The challenging part to this though is um, I'm not sure there's money in the state budget yet for this. So you're adopting a plan that I'm not sure is going to be funded, but I don't wanna miss the, um, the, the deadline. So, um, as with everything else this year, the, the timing is gonna be a little bit funny. So um, I think some of you were here for that uh, conversation. What we were gonna spend our Student Opportunity Act on is because we added two nurses to our staffing this year, we were going to identify the Student Opportunity Act funds to support those two nursing positions or a percentage of those two nursing positions, whatever, whatever we could. So, um, if I could ask that someone make a motion that we spend our Student Opportunity Act on the two additional nurses that we that we added. And again, you've taken this vote before. I just wanna make sure we have a recent vote um, in case, um, you know, they said we made that in a prior fiscal year. I, I Again, I, I'm not sure all the rules that are changing, but we're taking, again, the $100,000 that's gonna be rolled into our Chapter 70 and we're spending it on uh, nurses' salaries, or we're identifying that pool of money um, for whatever we can for the additional nursing positions that we added in fiscal 21. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. That's my motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, Ms. Simon? Aye. Mr. Foss? Aye. Ms. Bond? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Chairman votes aye. That's five zero zero. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, moving on in the agenda, um, MCAS testing. I want to um, thank Ms. Simon for sharing um, the article from um, Alfie Cohn. Um, and so, Ms. Simon, I enjoyed um, his perspective. I sort of always do. He's, he's, um, um, He's an he's an interesting researcher and and has uh, has strong opinions. Um, the meeting with the commissioner last week, um, the state is going to be administering MCAS tests. Um, 
the commissioner said they are not going to be used for accountability, only diagnostic, uh, only diagnostics. I think he said uh, for the K to eight students, they were going to try to shorten the test. And I don't really know what that means, but I think they don't want the test to take uh, as long. Um, I think everyone's primary concern was about high school students because we didn't want to deny anyone a, um, a diploma. And I think we've already covered uh, what's happening with our, with our high school students. So um, as of right now, as of today, MCAS is happening. I believe it's gonna be a shortened test. I believe it's going to be um, used for diagnostic purpose, purposes only. Um, and we're still waiting on information as to whether we could administer it um, at home for students who are remote or what the logistics are going to um, we're go are going to be. So I don't have any information there other than um, uh, we're going to have some sort of modified MCAS testing experience according to the commissioner last week. And, um, and again, that, that again could change, but uh, that's, um, that's the update that I have on MCAS testing. And again, I think I've been pretty clear with my thoughts on that is if it's diagnostic only, we have um, better diagnostic assessments that, um, that we use already in the district. Um, but, um, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of do, we'll try to do what we're asked. And um, I'm still not sure how we're going to administer it to um, our remote students. When I get that information, I will, um, I'll share that with the committee. All right, any comments, questions? Okay, um, next item or is that the end? No, the next item, Madam Chair, is really the committee's item and that's on the uh, second reading of the resolution. Uh, yeah, the resolution. Uh, MCAS and high stakes testing. Um, again, I would say the, um, um, the state, I did think listened, I think they went halfway. I think it's no longer a, an accountability uh, year, but uh, they're not backing away from administering the standardized test. Um, so again, if the committee votes this on a second reading, we can certainly submit the resolution. Um, Sharon can send your resolution to um, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, how about some input on whether or not people want to do it? Um, again, I think the feelings last time were um, uh, essentially um, four people were in support. Uh, Mrs. Monaco, you were um, a bit skeptical. Um, so um, I think if those positions haven't changed, um, uh, that would be the uh, resolution. Would do I, would like me to read the resolution again? Sure. I was hoping you would say, oh, don't bother. Um, oh, don't bother. Uh, resolution, um, MCAS and high stakes testing. Uh, whereas the MASC membership and MASC board of directors have previously and repeatedly taken the position of opposing high stakes testing, including the MCAS. And whereas the COVID-19 remote learning model has negatively and disproportionately affected students with learning disabilities, students of lower socio socioeconomic status, ELL students, and students who identify as minorities, and whereas the social and emotional trauma, both individually and collectively, has yet to be truly realized in the students who have experienced the shutdown of their local school buildings and separations from their peers and supportive adults, and whereas the students of the Commonwealth have already missed valuable face-to-face -face instructional opportunities with their teachers and would benefit from focusing on those important instructional opportunities and social emotional supports, Therefore, be it resolved that MASC rejects the calls for the students of 2022 who missed their 10th grade MCAS testing to be required to make it up during the 2020-2021 school year or ever. We demand those students be held harmless for not taking the MCAS and that their graduation requirements shall be determined by locally controlled voices of the school committee and school administration within the remaining graduation requirements of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Additionally, we reiterate our call for a moratorium on all high stakes testing for the 2020-2021 school year so all students can benefit from their time being focused on direct instruction and we urge the legislature to enact a moratorium on high stakes testing um, for three years. 
All right, does someone want to make a motion to um, approve this? If you do, go ahead and we can talk about it. If if you don't, then we won't. Uh, again, Madam Chair, I think a motion was made and it was discussed as a first reading. Do you need another motion for a second reading? Yes. Okay. I move that we adopt the resolution as written. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, okay. let's have some discussion. Uh, I, I guess I was the only skeptic. Are the rest of you in favor? Tom, go ahead. Um, I share some of your skepticism, but I think under the current conditions, I think it was um, uh, an appropriate um, attempt. Uh, I think the water's under the bridge to a certain degree, but there is, is some language in there about gears going forward. So um, I think it's still important message to send um, and uh, I would support it. All right, anyone else comment? Yeah, Hi. Madam Chair, I especially, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I especially like the language about that that speaks to local control and especially this year um, with with things as upside down as they are. Um, at least for 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 this year, uh, if we determine what the graduation requirements would be rather than the state, um, that appeals to me. All right. Uh, does anyone else want to speak, or I'll put it to a vote. I'd, I'd just like to add also um, that I, I do think that given the pandemic, that there are many other priorities that we should be spending our time with and mm -hmm. ways we should be challenging our students rather than helping them learn how to take a test again. Um, and I think that Dr. Conti has done a really good job of setting those priorities well in terms of making sure that we are looking at the health and the social emotional well being of our students. While we don't let go of, yes, we're teaching students academics as well, but that um, in this year, this time of a pandemic and other incredibly stressful issues going on in our society, I think that it's a really important thing for us to make a statement about, and I still support it. Okay. Um, so, all those in favor of the motion as presented, Ms. Simon? Aye. Mr. Foss? Aye. Ms. Bond? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. And Chairman votes aye. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. We will um, we will inform um, MASC that, that uh, you've uh, adopted this uh, resolution as a as Burlington has the school committee as a community, um, and um, I'm hoping there are still further adjustments to be to be made to the uh, current direction that we're we're going. And again, I do think the state has has come halfway, and I'm, I'm hoping they um, you know they'll continue. Um, there's going to be, I believe, some significant changes in the next two weeks to four weeks um, in terms of um, relief. Uh, packages that are, I hope, providing some revenue replacement for uh, cities and towns, um, which would then um, help impact schools, as Nicole mentioned. And um, I also believe there's going to be, I hope, more flexibility extended through um, the uh, Federal Department of Education uh, under new leadership. So, um, again, all of my colleagues are sort of um, holding their, we're, we're all just sort of waiting for the next uh, few weeks. Um, the uh, the new secretary of education is the uh, commissioner from Connecticut. He's uh, he's a, a very he's a known uh, commodity. He has a very good relationship with the Massachusetts commissioner and uh, someone we're all uh, familiar with. So um, I That's think great. having uh, someone from New England in in that spot, I think would be is is going to be helpful helpful to us. Okay, um, one last question. Uh, are things going well at the middle school with live streaming? Um, I have a, uh, a working group meeting on Thursday nights, and I have some parent representatives there who have middle schoolers. And the feedback was, uh, again, um, was unanimously positive. So I, I do think um, 
I think uh, the middle school has made some adjustments to their schedules. I do want to uh, acknowledge that the teachers have really jumped into this and they are um, putting forth a tremendous amount of effort to do that. I think the the comments from the parents were the, the students were um, felt more connected and more engaged with their learning over the entire week and mm -hmm. not just on the days that um, they were in person. So I, I think that was some of the, again, the, the early feedback that we've had, but uh, it's, it's um, again, recognizing that the administration, I think, put together a, a lot of effort to make the change and that the teachers are really working hard to execute it. Great. Well, thanks to both the teachers and the administration. Okay, is there anything else to come before the committee? Um, Anybody? No? All right. No, uh, I guess, to, motion to adjourn. Um, uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. Ms. Simon? Aye. Mrs. Bond? Aye. Ms. Boss? Hi. Mr. Murphy. Hi. Chairman votes aye. We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Hi.